Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. I, I trust you have an outline. Actually, you have an outline, and I have one that's a little more detailed. So if I say things that's not in your outline, uh, ignore the outline, but listen to me. Okay? Philippians chapter 2. Now our text for this morning, I'm going to read it and I'm going to pray. And this, this is a Christmas sermon. And when I read it, you won't see Mary and you won't see Joseph. You won't hear any angels. And there's no baby. But this is a Christmas sermon. So when I'm, and it's hidden in the text, it's hidden. So as I read, see if you can discover, actually there's probably a number of places, but I'm thinking of one in particular that indicates that this is referring to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, before, before I get to, my, well, let me read the first four verses. That's a little review from last week. We talked about uh, unity. Verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies and those four statements are all true, since those statements are true, we have the main expression of action, fulfill ye my joy. And how do we fulfill the apostles' joy? That ye may be what? Like-minded, having the mind of Christ, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in contrast, but in lowliness of mind. So we have... Uh, we have like-minded in verse 2. You see that? We have one mind in verse 2. And now we have in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So these first four verses are all about others. Now how does verse 5 begin? It begins with a command, and it's about that same word, right? Mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. In being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord, this morning for these dear people. We're thankful, Lord, for health and strength uh, to be here and to rejoice that we can serve Thee, to rejoice, that we can praise Thee, to rejoice, uh, that we can hear from Thy Word. We think of those that are involved in junior church, both children and teachers, and we pray, Lord, that You would guide and bless them this hour. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our president. We pray for our governor and other leaders, both, both local and, and state and national that they would be ministers to us for good, that they would choose the good and promote the good and write good laws and reverse evil laws. We pray for the sick, that you would place your hand of healing upon them. We pray for ourselves, that we would draw close to thee. Speak to us through thy word this morning. In Christ's name, amen. The question I ask, what, what part of this passage indicates this is Christmas? Actually, it's, um, it's verse 6, and it's verse 7, and it's verse 8, right? This is referring, and I've got some specific things I'm going to talk about, but this is referring 
to the humiliation, the birth of Christ, where God, who always has been, right? We believe in the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, but He came and took on flesh. He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So this is a Christmas story, right? It's not, it's not a narrative like we see in the Gospels, but this is a, a wonderful teaching of Christ. Notice verse 5. Verse 5 begins with a what? That's not permission like, oh, I'm going to let you do this. This is a command. Uh, this is an imperative. So what is this mind of Christ? What does that look like? Do you think Christ was humble? No. Do you think He had a humble mind? Do you think He was obedient? Do you think he listened to his father? We're obedient. We're humble. Uh, we're listening. Was he willing to endure pain and suffering and abuse and a cruel Roman crucifixion? That is, right? What is the mind of Christ? That's the mind of Christ. But also... Do we have the mind of Christ? Do I have the mind of Christ? Do I, do I a broader question, do I think God's thoughts after Him? So where do we find God's thoughts? Do, don't I ask tough questions? Where do you find God's thoughts in the book? So the more we're in the book, the more we'll and the more we're in the book and read the book and memorize the book and meditate on the book and we're in the book, the more we will begin to think God's thoughts after him. Because that's not natural, is it? Do you ever have your own thoughts? Do you like all your own thoughts? Are they all good thoughts and great thoughts and thoughts to relish and thoughts to meditate on? Aren't you glad we don't share all our thoughts with each other? You agree? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad I don't know all your thoughts? And I am certainly glad that you don't know, know all my thoughts. So thinking is, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, right? That, that's, that's the way that person is. So we want to think God's thoughts. See, Christ, do you realize they spit in his face? And they, they beat him? And they took a reed and, and smote him? He was humble. He was unified. He renounced self. You know, we live in a world where people seek power, don't they? Do they seek power? Governmental leaders seek power. They, they take too much power to themselves, sometimes even in the home. Some person seeks all the power, all the decisions, and it's really, it becomes, it becomes <coughs> abusive. So how can we have the mind of Christ? Can you imagine, just think about it. You're in heaven, right? Is everything perfect in heaven? Yes. Wonderful. So who was in heaven? God was in heaven, right? Three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So Christ is in heaven. And where, where did, did he leave heaven? Did he come down here? Did he walk the earth? Was he hungry? Was he tired? Did he suffer abuse? And as a human, right, he is the, it's, it's a, it's a hyphen, right? He's not God and man. He's the God-man, technically. Did he experience what we experience? The Bible says he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet, yet without sin. So he, understand our, he understands our pain. Now, he didn't sin. He couldn't sin, technically. But he understands what we're experiencing. Do you think, in a, on a human level, it was quite shocking to, to be Christ down here? Shocking. And yet, we have to have that mind. 
I just have an A, B, C, and D, and E. To have the mind of Christ, and we want to have, we want to think His, in this passage, we want to think His thoughts after Him. First of all, He was not selfish, was He? Do you think He was a selfish seven-year-old? Think He picked, picked on His brothers or sisters? Did He ever throw a tantrum? Was he ever angry uh, in an ungodly way? The, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. That's a command, right? Some things, if we're living for Jesus, some things will make us what? Angry. Though it's hard to be angry and spiritual at the same time. Right? It's really, it's really isn't it so? It's really quite a knife edge. So let's look right at our text. Notice he's, he's our example. Let this mind be in you. Have, have the mind of Christ in verse, verse 6 who being in the form of God and when we think of the word form we think of right form, shape sides silhouette something you can, something you can trace you know paint by number, I'm an artist paint by number but this is internal. This is essence. This is character, right? This, this refers to his attributes. He is God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus Christ is the brightness of his glory. That's the Father's glory. And the expressed image, the exact replica of his person. Jesus Christ said, I and the Father are what? One. Now, if you're a believer this morning, are you one with the triune God? Yes, but that's a different oneness, right? We are in Christ. He is in us. We have this wonderful union and communion. We have this wonderful, the Bible says what? Christ in you, right? The hope of glory. But the oneness of the Trinity is much different. So Christ is God. Notice again verse 6. Who being in the form of God, Jesus Christ is God, right? He's not just a created being. He's not just an archangel. He's not, he's not just in the heavenly host. Jesus Christ, even though there's only one God, right? One essence. And that one essence is manifested not in person, but in three distinct persons. At one time, the persons had no, they did not have any physical parts, body parts. But now, if, if you would go to, wouldn't it be all right to go to heaven today? Are you ready? Yes. Heavy bags packed, ready to go, amen? Now listen, now listen to me. If you go to heaven, if we would go to heaven, all go to heaven right now, you, would ne you, you can't see God the Holy Spirit. He's a spirit. You will never, you'll never see God the Father because He's a spirit. He's still a spirit, but who will you see? Jesus. And the Bible says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't understand all that, but I believe that because the Bible teaches that. So here Jesus Christ is God. Oftentimes the cults, they, they minimize his deity. They maximize his humanity. You know why they do that? Because they don't understand the Trinity. Well, neither do I. I don't understand it. I do accept it because it's very clearly stated in the scriptures. But what did he do with his position? What did he do with his status? Verse 6 who being in the form of God, thought it not robbed to be equal to God. In other words, he didn't grasp it. He didn't hold on to it. He didn't snatch it. He didn't say, it's mine. I'm going to hold on to it. He emptied himself. He, 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 he didn't empty himself of his attributes. He simply laid them aside. In other words, he stopped using them, but they still were there, right? The whole time he walked the earth and he humbled himself, he listened, he did the Father's will, you know, he came to do the Father's will, and he suffered. Could he have called 10,000 angels? Yes. Could he have defended himself? Yes. What did he say to Peter? Put up your sword. 
He could have done all that. So he still had his attributes. He still had his deity. He still had his uh, characteristics as God. He simply laid them aside. They still were there, and he, didn't, he, he decided not to use them, except every once in a while he would say something. He would know things that no one else can know but God, right? He, he walked on the water. He multiplied fishes and loaves, right? He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He always was God, but he laid those aside to be an example to us. So he was, he was not going to hold on to those things. He was, he was selfless. He was not a status person. It's not all about him. He had everything, right? And he laid it aside. Why did he do that? Why did he come and die? For me and for you. Again, right back in our, our verse here. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Let's keep moving on in our passage. But made himself of no reputation. He made himself, and, and the word no reputation there means, it literally means to pour out. He emptied himself. He made himself uh, of no reputation. He could have protected himself. And he, he uh, this, this is, uh, I believe the, it's, this is called the kenosis passage. This is the emptying. But it's not really emptying in a technical sense. It's simply a laying aside. So let's move on. So he's, uh, he doesn't seek status. And he, secondly, be in your outline. Notice the end of seven. And it took upon him the form of a what? What kind of... Is this, a, is this a hired? Is this domestic help? What is this? Slave. He was a bond slave. He ministered to others. In other words, he didn't pretend to be a slave, did he? Not an actor. He actually was a bond slave to God the Father. You know, we live in a world, isn't it true that we live in a world that people like to defend themselves? Uh, by the way, if someone's breaking into your home, I hope you defend yourself. Okay, that, that's... Yeah, go ahead, shoot my wife and kids. I, you know, burn my I just, I'm, I'm not saying that. Do we have any hockey fans here? Hockey fans. We've got a few. <laughs> you know how close we are to the big bad Bruins? That dates me a bit. What, what is, ever, ever go to a, a a boxing match and a hockey game breaks out. What, 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 what is it? What, what is it about hockey? By the way, there's a real problem in hockey, like in football and other sports, of, of brain, serious brain injuries. You know one reason they fight? I'm going to date myself again, but it's, I'm, I'm fine. How many of you know who Wayne Gretzky was? And, oh, we got, we got a few hands. Now, Whenever Gretzky, and he played a long time, and he, I think he, unless it's been broken recently, he scored more goals than anyone else. But one thing about Gretzky is no one touched Gretzky. Because on his teams, there were goons. These guys were tall and big, and they had no front teeth. And when any, listen, when anyone got near Gretzky, what would the goon, he'd lay the lumber on them. Right? Their job, their jo that's why they're in the NHL. They couldn't skate, couldn't skate forward very well, couldn't go backwards, couldn't shoot, really, really slow, but they could do what? They could fight. That's one reason. Matter of fact, if Gretzky got two or three or four or five, six good checks a game, he wouldn't have played very long, right? Even if they were legal. So no one touched Gretzky. It's all right for hockey, but is it all right for the Christian? We need to be like Christ, right? 
He was just a slave. He was just a servant. Um, he, in other words, it was all about others. Let's move on again, and we're, we're there in verse 7. So he's serving. He's not a status person. He's, he's ministering to others. He took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He was a man. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Hebrews Excuse me, John chapter 13. John, John chapter 13. John, I'm just going to dip in and out of this passage. I want to make a point. John chapter 13, verse 4. And Jesus Christ, he had risen from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. He was doing the job of the servants of the house. After that, verse 5, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And of course, you know the story, you know, Peter, Peter said, you're not going to wash me. And then, you know, Peter, he kind of overreacted and said, you know, give me a complete bath right there. And so he was kind of kind of in, in balance there. And uh, so verse 12, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was sat down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you. What, what's his purpose? Is it because... The house slave hadn't done it and their feet were dirty because they wore sandals and didn't have paved roads. That wasn't the point. Even though that all may have been true. Verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord, and He was, right? He was Master. He was Lord. Verse 14, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, what, what should we do? Isn't that interesting? I had a professor in college who was a, <clears throat> for a while, he was a Grace Brethren minister. He was, a, he was a military chaplain and a Grace Brethren minister. You may be familiar with the Grace Brethren denomination. They're a lot like us. But one thing they do that's unique to them is when they have the Lord's table, they actually wash feet. As our youngest son says, because he went to a church that washed feet, he said they were the cleanest feet in church. Because <laughs> when everyone, before everyone came to church, guess what they did? They washed their feet because you didn't want people to. Anyway, we won't get into the details here. And and I'm not suggesting we do that, but it, but if but if I'm washing Brother Bill's feet, that there's something humbling about that because wh the way they did it in the old days is the women would wash the women's feet and the men would wash the the men's feet but the point is this is humble sacrificial servants service for the benefit of us. that that's the point and we ought to do that and we can do that in all kinds of ways we can have that that servant mentality. I just want to. I just want to stop here and make a point. I am just thrilled. I have been pastoring a year or two of five. Can you tell that? I've been at it a while. And one thing I really appreciate about you folks is such a servant mentality. On Wednesday nights, it's kind of like a beehive around here. There's kids running around and they're dropping food on the floor and there's all all kinds of workers and teachers and. And I just think, and I see a lot of people just, and we do it on Sundays and do it on Wednesdays. And, you know, people clean and people teach and people mow. And hopefully we're going to get to some shoveling, right? We need some shoveling. But that spirit comes from the Lord. Amen? Just serving, whether it's washing feet or shoveling snow or teaching kids or, or whatever. I just, I, I really appreciate that wonderful spirit. Just loving, you know, isn't that great? Just have it, because we really are. I'm so glad I'm the part of the family of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a reason I don't lead the choir, right? 
Amen. I don't know where we are in my notes. You ought to, listen, you ought to try to read them. I, I can't read them myself. Let's move right on here in our text. Notice that, notice that attitude. Let's jump right into verse 6. And being found as, in, in fashion as a man. He was a man. What did he do? He humbled him. That's what the text says. You know what that means? Talk about yourself less. Maybe not talk about yourself at all in certain situations. Think of others, don't think of your what? Have you ever met someone, their whole thoughts, all their thoughts, all their actions, all their speech is about whom? We call that narcissistic, right? Their, their self, just, just give them a minute and they're going to go on and on about themselves. Listen, Christ was thinking about, remember Joy, Jesus, others, you. It's about others. This word, it means to lower yourself, to make low. He that is greatest among you shall be your what? Shall be your servants. For whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, but he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. The Apostle Paul says, I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere, and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can be what I ought to be in Christ. Jesus Christ was a man of, of great humility. Again, verse 8, who being in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And what did he become? Obedience. That's a wonderful word in the original language. It lit, there's a preposition in front, in front of it that means under. What's a preposition? A preposition is anywhere a mouse can go. That's not a technical definition, by the way, teachers and scholars. But under, and the second part of the word means to hear. A humble person is under authority, right? Listen, a humble person is listening for the master. A humble person is listening to the boss. A humble person is listening to the general, right? A humble person is under authority, and they're what? They're, they're listening for God's direction. That is, listen, listen, folks, it's not about your will, it's about His will. Not my will, but thine will be... Thy will be done. Let me speak to the young people for a minute. Are you seeking God's will? You better. Amen. You know what it means for the adults? Were any of you as teenagers ever rebellious? Were you ever... Just, just for a moment... We don't, we don't want to share those stories, do we, right? I won't if you won't. Sometimes when you're young, you think, if, if I, I used to think this, I, I, we'll just get personal for a second. I used to think if I gave my life to Jesus, I would end up being an, a missionary in Africa and I don't like bugs. <laughs> or I'd have to go to a foreign country and learn a strange language and I really struggle with English. If you put God first, will He open doors? Yes. He'll shut doors, right? Yes. He'll open doors. Will, he, will you starve? No. Will He provide? Because yes. we think, if I, you know, God's leading me this way, but if I go that way, I, you know, I won't make it. I won't have enough money. I'm, oh, it's very... I, I could be... It, would, it might be dangerous to live in Mexico. Really? Yeah, it is dangerous to... But if you're in God... Isn't the safest place for the believer in God's will? I don't want to leave Somerville. He might want you to live in Africa. I'm, I'm, I'm ruining my point, right? The point is, if you put Him first, if you listen to Him, will He guide you? Yes. Do you want to be in His will? Do you want... 
Do you, want, you don't want to get out of His will, do you? See, listen to Christ. Notice this for us. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient. He was listening. Obedience means what? Under and to hear. An obedient person is listening to the direction of God. They're in the Word of God, right? They're listening to the Word of God. They're listening to God. They're being guided by the Spirit. And they're listening to the Spirit, right? And they're being led. Listen, they're being led by the Spirit. And they're hearing, Revelation 2 and 3, and they're hearing what the Spirit says to the churches, and that applies to us today. Are you being led? Are you listening? Are you hearing? Are you filled with the Spirit? If you do His will, do you think He'll be your debtor? If you do His will, do you think that you'll lose you won't make it. You'll be hungry. You won't have insurance. You won't have transportation. You'll be homeless. If you do His will, my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. By whom? By Christ Jesus. You want to be happy? You want to... Blessed are they. Remember the, remember the blessed Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5? If you do His will, if you listen to His word, if you commit yourself 100% to Christ, He will bless you beyond your wildest imaginations. Do you believe that? Do you really, really? Because He'll do that. Did God the Father bless God the Son? Yes. Did He have to go to the cross? Yes. Could He have said no? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> we'll have to discuss that later. But he was obedient. And he did listen. And, and listen, what, what kind of death? Verse 8. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And what kind of death? Not, not just any kind of death. A specific death. A cruel death. An excruciating painful death. A long drawn out death. I want to conclude by reading a passage to you uh, from the book of, um, book of Matthew. You don't need to turn there. I'll read Matthew, just one verse. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then sent Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, are we going to follow Christ? Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to have the mind of Christ? Are you going to think Christ's thoughts after him? Verse 24, And he said, If any man come after me, let him do what? Do you remember the three things? Deny himself, say no to yourself, take up his cross and do what? Follow me. And I trust that all of us today will dedicate ourselves anew and afresh to having the mind of Christ. Amen?